in the cashier's church at 7 o'clock. Our response given will be next Sunday the 15th and the lunch will follow. Um, I would like those that have their name on the sheet if we could have a conversation after worship. That would be great. Um, other th the other thing, I um, was in touch with the Clydesdale Food Bank and um, they thank me very much for contacting them and uh, we, wel we would welcome any dry or tin foods, household or personal hygiene items. At present we are having to buy the full range of products on a weekly basis to meet demand. The weekly shopping bill is £3,000. So they are in, in need. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very for all your help. I'm going to keep this here. Can you still hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. It's coming through the speaker, but if you can't hear me, just let me know and I'll be able to either raise the volume or increase my volume from here. So, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How are you feeling after all these wet days? Good? good? good. <laughs> That's right. Good right. So good morning. As I always say, God always brings order into chaos. I was running from Boys Brigade and Girls Brigade dedication service, which we did at Castell, and I was panicking that how is that going to go? I was really nervous, but that went well, thank God for that. But then I went, came, I'm trying, driving here, and there's a slow driver trying to just drive slowly. And I said, God, no, I need to be there quickly. And as soon as I saw Willie, he said, Oh, thank God you're here. I said, Oh, no. But, and then Susan said, This thing is not working. But, Praise God that the note which was not working is now working. The system we were thinking is not going to help is helping. See, this is how God does. Everything was chaos. In Genesis it says everything was chaos, right? But God brings order into chaos. Sometimes you will see people going mad when they are touched by God. I believe they are actually touched by evil spirit if they don't bring order into their life. Evil spirit bring disorder in your life, but the Holy Spirit will always bring order, discipline, manners in your life. And that's what the Holy Spirit work is. Now the topic we're going to theme which we are going to uh, discuss is quite important one that we need to understand what are, what, what is it God would like to teach us through this parable. It's a parable of vineyard where God, when, when a master just gave them a, a place to work, serve and then earn from it. But they are replying the goodness of the master with their evil. That's not acceptable in the eyes of God. But I would like to share what would still God wants to do with us. And that will be the theme for today's message which I'm going to share with you in a few minutes. Let's take a moment of silence and then prepare ourselves to worship our God in truth and in spirit. Thank you. Long, long ago, a vineyard was planted. The ground was prepared and all was made ready. But the vines grew wild. The ground wasn't able to support the wild grapes. What happened in that place of promise? People forgot the one who planted the vineyard. They chose their own ways and failed, obviously. So let us all return to God. Let us again turn to His ways, who will again plant, who will again prune, and cause us to grow in faithfulness. Let us open our hearts to God, trusting in God's ways and God's ways and God's words and worship Him in truth. In Jesus' almighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Shall we all stand and sing our first hymn, hymn number 506, All I Once Held Dear. Do we know this hymn? <laughs> yes? Let's all stand and sing. Thank you.
Thank you very much for the reading. Um, can you all hear me anyway? Yes? I, should I do, use the microphone? Yeah. No? That's good. Thank you. So, uh, again, as I said, it's a very important parable Jesus shared with all of the Pharisees, actually, and obviously their disciples and other uh, people would be there as well. And Jesus wanted to know what do they think about this parable. Well, they all understood that Jesus was actually talking about them, talking about their opinion, talking about what is the truth they understand. What is the truth they are trying to destroy from ages? Because God said, Jesus said that you are actually, you have done the same with the prophets, with the people who came before me, the person like John the Baptist, person like, uh, you know, the, all the judges and people who are there to tell you the truth. And you try to destroy the truth because you believe that you have your own truth. In your opinion, through your background, through your understanding, you think that you have the truth. But if anyone is coming and telling you the truth, which is actually really a truth, you are trying to destroy that person. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And they don't like it. Then how can this man actually claim to be the son of God? How can he say that I am the way? How can he say that I am the truth? And how can he say that I am the life? Now, I'll tell you, a truth in its definition is exclusive. Right? There cannot be any other truth if there is only one truth. There will be always one truth and nothing more than that. Now, you try to cover the truth with the lies, you can still not hide the truth. You, it might be difficult to reach the truth because you have to go through all the lies. You can... Truth sometimes is bitter, unfortunately, because if you know that my truth is not right truth, you will try to stand against the truth. Truth cannot be deleted. Truth cannot be destroyed because it will remain as it is for centuries and for centuries from beginning to the end. Sunrise from? Sunrise from? Say it. That's the universal truth. Sunrise from? The east. East? There we go. Go back to your geography again. Right? So it cannot change. You cannot change the truth. Now, if tomorrow society will tell you the sun comes from the east, some of you will believe. Right? Some of us will believe that yes, this person might be telling you because unless and until we find the truth, the right source of the truth will be always deluded. And especially our kids. Because they are naive, they are too young, they are too innocent, and they will just believe if you say something with the, uh, with, with the commitment to them, they will believe you. So it's our responsibility to tell them the truth. Now, I'll do something, I'll share something with you, and let's see if you give me the right answer. I have a blue circle in my hand and a green circle in my hand. Right? Can you see them? A blue circle and a green circle? Right? Is that right? No? What is it? Grey. Grey? I think it's green. No? Is it not? Okay. Can you tell me which circle is big? Is it the grey one or the blue one? Raise your hand if you think the grey one is bigger than the yellow, uh, um, the blue one. No? Okay, what about who think that grey one is bigger than the blue one? Okay, thank you. How many of you believe that blue one is bigger than the black one or the grey one? Right? You believe that? It's good, thank you. Okay. Right? Oh, come on, Jimmy. Don't do that. See these people? Really? I'm not my friend anymore. What about this? I brought two figures to you. Two, whatever you call them, shapes. Number one, number two. Which one is bigger? This one? How many of you say this one is big? Okay. Margaret, you know my friend anymore either. <laughs> <laughs> Margaret is same. They both are same size, right? And what about this? Jimmy was right. 
I don't like Jimmy because he's telling you the truth. <laughs> they are same size too, right? But again, if you see them from different angle, they will look maybe separate, they're different size. And someone can actually, if they tell you with, with, the, with the proper pressure and commitment, you will believe that yes, one is bigger. So if I can change your mind with just two shapes, think about it, how much society are trying to change our mind from the truth God is telling. And that is what the problem with Jesus, Jesus with this Pharisees were. Jesus said, your truth is not the truth which I am telling you is the truth. You need to worship God, not in the temple, not with the sacrifice, not with anything else, but only in one way that you need to worship your God in truth and in spirit. Unfortunately, they have to stand against them because their shop, their business will close if they try to follow Jesus Christ. And that's the reason some of us get frustrated, get annoyed when somebody will come and tell you the truth. A lot of people get annoyed with me when I tell them that your theology which you're following is sometimes, it might be wrong. Now, they don't consider how much time I've spent studying. They don't know how many degrees I have. They don't know how long I'm Christian for. They don't know how many hours of my life of my day I spend in theology, but they think their theology and the way they see Christ is right. But I'm telling you, telling them the truth, but they don't understand it that way. Now, again, I'll do another experiment with you, which is easy. Can you, do you think this, these balloons can fly? Jimmy, what did you eat today? <laughs> breakfast. Must be a porridge. Do you think these can fly? No? Yes? How? Make it fly. No, 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 no. Like this, in this condition. <laughs> Susan know what I'm going through right now. She has a lot of us thoughts like that. No, no, I'm saying. Because Jimmy is keep interrupting me. <laughs> I'm just joking. Right. So, can this thing fly? No. I think no. And Jimmy is absolutely right. This they can fly, but you have to fill air in them, isn't it? Either this gas, uh, is it hydrogen? Helium. 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 Either helium or just a normal gas. But, I'm telling you, if you are like this, without the truth, what will happen? Drop dead. Drop dead. But, if you fill your life with the truth. What is truth? The kindness. What is truth? That Jesus died for you. What is truth? That you have the fruit of the Spirit. Faithfulness. Discipline. Care. Um, what else? What are the fruit of the Spirit? Self-discipline. Right? What will happen? <laughs> Land on Jimmy. Exactly what I wanted. When you fill your life with the truth of God, you can fly. If you have the truth of God in you, you can go further than just dead like this. You can fly because you have the truth of God in you. The compassion God likes to offer. Love your neighbor. Don't be jealous. Don't be angry. Don't envy. Go and read 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It'll tell you what does the love mean. And that's what God wants. God was trying to share the same thing with these Pharisees. But what they did, they killed the son, they killed all the other wine dressers, all the other slaves of the master, and they thought, we will, we can own his truth. And that was wrong, as you can see. In your moral understanding, that is wrong. Right, we'll continue after that. Let's stand again and sing our next hymn, hymn number 473. My hope is built on nothing less. Thank you. 473 is like kingdom come. Sorry? Oh, we should praise 473. My Jesus. No, no, it's just Sorry.
Can you hear me okay now? Okay. Okay. So, what I was talking about, the chaos, and then I was talking about the truth. I hope we can, what, once I'm going to share this reflection with you, I hope you will understand what exactly God would like to share with us when He is talking about the order, when He is talking about the truth which He would like to share with us. Jesus said to them, all of them, listen to another parable as that he has read. In the last verse he said, Jesus said in the beginning, listen to another parable. Well, Jesus could have just said, get ready for another confrontation. Get ready for another argument between the Pharisees and me. He could have said that because he knew everything he's going to share with them because he's telling them the truth and they don't like that truth. They will argue with me. They will confront whatever I am sharing with them. Now regardless of what you think about the Pharisees, you've got to give them some credit today. Why? They got, they, they got it. They got the answer. They got the gist of that parable. They understood the parable that Jesus shared with them. When they heard Jesus, they realized he was talking about them. Now normally they would say, you talk in riddles, you talk in parables and we don't understand and even the disciples don't used to understand and they will go to Jesus and say, ask what is the meaning of it. But on this occasion they clearly understood that Jesus is actually blaming them for killing all the prophets and Jesus is claiming that you are going to kill me as well. Jesus held before them a truth they don't like and they don't want it to put a stop to it. They wanted to arrest him and then brutally kill him. That is what the plan. Well, this is neither Jesus' first nor his last confrontation with Pharisees. If you read the Bible, we can find many of these arguments in the Bible. And we all tend to avoid those uh, arguments with whom we have conflict or confrontation. As a human nature, normally, well, some people thrive on the arguments and confrontation, but person, uh, if you are humble in heart, you normally try to avoid those people and those circumstances. But not Jesus, not Jesus. He just keeps on coming to these Pharisees. At every turn, he is offending them, aggravating them, and confronting these Pharisees and telling them clearly that you are wrong and I am bringing you the truth. Well, he eats with the wrong people to start with. He won't answer their question when they answer. He won't give them straightforward answers. He taught them by breaking the law and healing on the Sabbath, which was a big no, no for all these Pharisees. They will stand against it. They will find they to, uh, to have a confrontation with you and they can even kill you if you try to change that truth which they have already in their heart. He calls them hypocrite and call them blind teachers and as you know blind cannot lead another blind. He escaped their traps so many times he did that. He leaves them speechless because they said where does he get all this wisdom? He's just a carpenter's son. Where does he get all the, uh, all the wisdom? He leaves them speechless. He rattles off the strings of woes against them. Woe to you. Woe to this and woe for that. He compares them to a disobedient son who will not work in the vineyard. No, they just can't catch a break with this Jesus. No. So what's all about that? Why can't Jesus just let them go? Why? You just don't give up on them and what does that have to do with us today now again i would like to share a big secret here for our lord and hope you will understand that why all this confrontation jesus you must be a god who is humble who is lovely and who is always polite you don't want to be in arguments and confrontation we don't want our lord to be like that do we if I start doing on every topic you bring me, I start to argue with you, which sometimes I did in the Bible study actually, you won't like me, would you? You say, what kind of minister he is? Everybody actually uh, says, Susan, oh, what a lovely minister she is. I was doing the wedding and they said, oh, what a lovely Susan was because she's always polite and humble. But you want a minister like that. You want the Son of God not to be argumentative. 
all the time, but Jesus was. Why? You need to ask this question. Well, is Jesus looking for a fight? No, I don't think so. Is his primary motivation to expose and condemn those who do not follow him? No, I don't think so. Is he keeping score and naming all the bad attitudes and bad behaviors of the Pharisees that he considered wrong? Well, I don't think so. In Jesus trying to exclude them from the kingdom of God, the religious leaders of this day? Well, I don't think so. So if I don't think so, that this is truth, then what it is? Here what I think these confrontations are about and that's going to be useful for you and me. Jesus is unwilling to give up on these Pharisees. He is unwilling or anyone else, anyone else of that matter. He is treating them as a bad behavior child <coughs> like you must have all. A naughty boys and girls, those who do wrong, what do you do? You don't give up on them, do you? So is our Lord. Though he knows that they are wrong and corrupt from their every bet, Jesus is not giving up on them. He is keep coming back on them and telling them, go to you, correct yourself. That's what I want. And that's what he's doing to you and me, my friends. When we go wrong, when we, when we go and believe in the lies and the facts of the worlds, Jesus said, let me tell you the truth, my son, because truth will set you free. He wants us to be free because he's not giving up on us. Jesus is unwilling to give up on you and on me. He is keep coming back to you and me. That is the good news. That is the hope and that is the joy in today's parable. It's not another parable of confrontation and argument. It's not. It's again showing the love of God. That he said, I am happy to go to that extent that I have to die for these unwilling, undisciplined kids. I am happy to do that. This is not so much for just a parable of exclusion or condemnation, my friend. But I think it is a parable of Jesus' unwillingness to give up on us and on those Pharisees. His unwillingness to give up on the often confrontation with us, with the truth about our lives that is always, almost always difficult to hear and accept. We might hear his word, but do we realize he is talking about us? That's a very important thing we need to understand. This parable and the confrontation, this parable provokes our like a mirror held before us so that we might see and recognize in ourselves that Jesus sees and recognizes. This is not a condemn. This is not to condemn us, but to recover us from the places of our self-exclusions, to call us back to life and to lead us home. That is what this parable is about, my friend. Jesus doesn't exclude us or anyone else from the kingdom of God. He don't want to. And if anyone is excluding themselves from the kingdom of God, he said, come back. I'm not giving up on you. He doesn't have to, my friends. Obviously, he doesn't have to. We do it ourselves and we are pretty good at it, excluding ourselves. And that's what the Pharisees have done. Though the kingdom of promise from day one to them, a promised land here and then promised land on, on, in heaven, they were still disobeying, they are still excluding themselves from all that God has promised for them. That's what the Pharisees have done, my friend. The Pharisees have excluded themselves from the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of God will be taken away from you, Jesus said in his word. It will be taken away from you if you keep continue doing what you're doing. Jesus says that kingdom will be taken away from you. This is not so much a punishment of, uh, for failing to produce kingdom fruit. No, it's not. It is rather the recognition of what already is. That already right now you are excluded if you do not change your behavior. Somebody asked me, and I've told you this so many times, that why would a good God, a loving God, will send me to the hell? And I said, he is not sending you to hell, my friend. You are already on your way to the hell. Straight, you are going to the hell. He provides your provision to turn towards Jesus and then go to heaven. That's what he's doing. 
We have already excluded ourselves from the kingdom of heaven. But Jesus came in the middle and said, I'm not giving up on you. Take turn. Move aside. Because you are going to the hell. I am trying to save you. Jesus is just named the reality, the truth there. They have excluded themselves in the same way the kingdom of God will be given to those who are already producing the kingdom of fruit, obviously. This is not a reward but a recognition of what already is. Jesus is telling them another truth. Where the, where the fruit is, there also is the kingdom, isn't it? If they want to know what all the fruits of the kingdom look like, then look at the life of God revealed in Jesus Christ. What do you see? You see love, intimacy, mercy, forgiveness, justice, generosity, com uh, compassion, the presence of God, wisdom, truth, healing, reconciliation, self-surrender, joy, thanksgiving, peace, obedience, humility. That's the kingdom. That's the fruit in the kingdom of heaven. And I'm not talking about these things as abstract idea, but as li living realities, as lived realities in the vineyards of our lives. We all have been given one year, my friend. Don't think Jesus is talking about some land, a little land somewhere in the, in the in the wild. No. He's talking about you and me. He's talking about our own vineyard. They are the people. They are the relationship. They are the circumstances and events of our own life that God has entrusted to our care. Could be our family, could be our community, could be our neighbor, could be anyone. And that means our spouses, our marriages, our children, our family, our work, our church, our daily decisions, our choices, our hopes, our dreams, our concerns are the vineyards in which we are to reveal the presence of God and the life of God in those places. To produce the fruit of the kingdom. That's what God wants from you and me. The vineyards are work in those vineyards. And the fruit produced come together to show us to be sharer in the kings of kingdom or God or not. That is what God is asking you to do. To the degree we are not producing kingdom fruit, we have excluded ourselves from and rejected our share in the kingdom of God. We are living neither as the people God knows us or to be or nor as the people we truly want to be. We want to belong to Christ. In some way, we have stepped outside of ourselves and stepped outside our own lives. Because we are not producing the kingdom, the fruit of kingdom. That's the truth that when Jesus confronts the Pharisees on that day. And it's the same truth when Jesus confronts us today. Living a life God wants. On his truth, on his basis. How does that happen? What does self exclusion look like? Here is what I am of what I'm wondering. Do you ever struggle with perfectionism, self-condemnation, questions of whether you are enough or not? Maybe that's self-inclusion. Do you ever feel like you have to be controlled, be right, have all the answers? Maybe that's self-exclusion. Are you crying, grudging, anger, resentment? Maybe that's a self-exclusion. Do you look at others and begin to make judgments about their belief, about their choices, or about their lifestyle? Maybe that's the self-exclusion. Are there people in your life that you have chosen to let go of and rather than, rather than do the work of reconciliation and heal that relationship? Maybe that's self-exclusion. Do you go through a life of autopilot, going through the motion but never really being present, never showing up? I think that is the exclusion. In your life, is there more criticism, more cynicism than thanksgiving and celebration? Maybe that's the self-exclusion. Remember when I was preaching? Are you whining or if there is a whine in your life? Are you hanging out on some old guilt that you believe could not be forgiven? Maybe that is the exclusion. And I'll tell you the truth here. The antidote to our self-exclusion from God's kingdom began with first recognizing that self-exclusion. That means we must look at the vineyard of our own lives. So how is your garden growing? You need to find that out. What do you see? You need to find that out. Is there a fruit? You need to find that out. Is there a light in your vineyard? That's you need to find out. Are you sharing the kingdom of God? That's what you need to find out. And you know what? On that point, 
God who is forgiving and never giving up on us will be found in our lives. And He will not confront you at that point. He will not argue with you because you are producing the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Kingdom. And He is ready to take you with Him. And that's the joy God would like to share with you and me. God bless you all. Let's join our hearts in prayer. Liberating God in love, you have set us free. Free from slavery to sin and self. Free to know and love you. Free to follow and serve you. Lord, we praise you for your faithful love towards us and for the many ways you have demonstrated that love to us, especially through the cross. Lord, we see your love in the natural world around us, in the sky and trees and rivers. We see your love in the gift of commandments and rules of living that guide us into right relationship with you and with people around us. And as we see your love in Jesus Christ, we are thankful, who lived and died to bring us life. Lord, because we have experienced your love, we come before you with confidence, bringing our needs and the needs of our world as well, Lord. Lord, especially we pray for those who live surrounded by violence, whether from war or political unrest, crime or, dom or domestic abuse, Lord. We pray for those who have been victim of violent crime and for those whose loved ones have been injured or murdered. Lord, we pray for those who find themselves involved in crime, whether by choice or through forces, those caught up into gangs or those who have turned to crime to pay for their addiction, those who are in prison. Lord, we especially pray for recent attack on Israelite by Hamas group. And there are people who are celebrating that attack. Lord, we pray for those people who think that crime is the answer. Lord, you be with them. You be with them, people who are in Israel and people who are the part of this group. Now, Lord, we pray for our homes and our families, for parents juggling with responsibilities of work and family, for husbands and wives whose marriages are breaking down, for children chaffing under parental authority or expectation, for men and women caught up in adultery or adulterous thoughts, Lord. Lord, we pray for the many people in our world who do not yet know you and have not experienced the way, the new life that comes from knowing Christ Jesus, who continue to search for purpose and meaning. Merciful God, give us strength and courage to keep your commandments, to live in faithful obedience to your will. Guard our hearts and minds from all that might distract us from living out our commitment to you and help us to find our true work in knowing you more fully and serving you more faithfully. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray, the one who is our friend and our cornerstone. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand once again and sing our closing hymn, How Deep the Love, uh, sorry, uh, How Deep the Father's Love for Us, hymn number 549. Thank you.
standing while we pray for our own. Lord, we rely on your promises that you will not forsake us. Lord, our pledge to you is that we will be faithful. So please accept this gift, the one we brought in this place and in so many other ways we share it with you. As we in our day make our responses to you, Lord. Let what we do be an example for others so that future believers can learn of Jesus and his ways. Amen. Let's receive the blessing of God. Now go in peace. Go in peace, love and care for one another in the name of Christ. And may God who is in you and around you uphold you in truth. May the Lord who is before you and behind you give you strength. May the Spirit who is to your left and to your right inspire all your thoughts, all your words and actions, both this now and forever.